Chapter 21, An Emerging World Power, 1890, 1918. 1918 is significant. That is the last year of World War One. We're going to, going to be talking about World War One here today, uh, towards the end of this uh, lecture. <clears throat> so, the United States is becoming a, a an emerging world power. And what does an emerging power need? You need land. You need overseas holdings. Um, you have to have access to the world. We talked about that. You need to become imperialistic. So what does that mean? What is imperialism? The policy of extending the rule or authority of an empire or nation over foreign countries or of acquiring and holding colonies and dependencies through diplomacy or military force. This is aggressive. This is taking over people's lands, uh, you know, extending your authority over an empire or foreign countries or acquiring, holding them. And, you know, creating dependencies that there you dependent and you hold that through diplomacy or 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 military if you need to. So understand what this what this is. So we remember the, the Treaty of Kanagawa a few couple chapters ago, the one that forced Japan to open trade with the United States and and allow uh, their ships to resupply there. Of course, the United States showed up with their navy in the harbor, kind of threatening them if they didn't do that. Uh, remember, we talked about coal stops and how, how to be a world power. You, you, you've you got to be out in the world, and to do that, you got to always have coal to supply your 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 uh, steamships in in those days to to keep going. You you can't really take it take all the all the coal that you would need, so you need to stop and and get it. Okay, so the Treaty of Kanagawa goes way back to 1854, and we talked about William Seward. He promoted a presence internationally for the United States and a presence in the Caribbean, Philippines, Hawaii, Panama Canal, Seward's, remember Seward's Folly, um, Alaska. Uh, but but not everybody was uh, was pro-imperialism. It, it was a bit of a fervor. I think most people thought, yeah, let's take over the world, make it all United States. But not everybody, according to William Jennings Bryan. Uh, William, William Jennings Bryan was the... Uh, one of the attorneys in the Scopes Monkey Trial. He was the one that was pro-creation. And he was an opponent to imperialism. God himself placed in every human heart the love of liberty. He never made a race of people so low on the scale of civilization or intelligence that it would welcome a foreign master. No, nobody, nobody is that low where they need to be told what to do and would welcome a master. Okay, so again, it goes back to the idea of science. There's, there's no subspecies of human beings. We're all the same. Um, so of course, Brian is is, is saying that you know, no nobody nobody wants this, but yet but America does, and for the most part, the American people at the turn of the century supported McKinley. This of course he would be, he would be assassinated, but they export they they um, they uh, supported expansionism, and this is the era that's called that's known for American exceptionalism, where. You know, the United States people believe that that they are exceptional compared to everybody else in the world. Uh, ethnocentric point of view. Um, from your book, the United States has a unique destiny to foster democracy and civilization uh, on the world stage. Uh, this is also from your book, uh, Josiah Strong, a minister. The American Anglo-Saxon race, so white people, represented the highest liberty, the purest Christianity, the highest civilization, and would spread itself over the earth. <clears throat> so what does this sound like? This, this sounds like manifest destiny. So manifest destiny didn't stop with Western expansion when it was sea to shining sea. It keeps going. So the imperialist era of, of United States history is, is very strongly pro-manifest destiny. Does, does that still go on today? So this, you know, again, we're, we're touching on that ethnocentric theme, this idea that the Anglo-Saxon race was superior to any other people of color. <clears throat> and, you know, how much evidence do we need? We can look across, across the entirety of American history, and it's obvious that this ideology is a very strong foundation from the very beginning. And we see evidence of this because of how people have been treated this far in American history. Uh, Native Americans, by this point of, of our story, are, are mostly gone, hanging by a thread in reservations. African Americans are, uh, were enslaved, but then freed, but not really freed, controlled by Jim Crow laws in the South, little opportunity in the North. 
Hispanic people had a huge part of their country taken from them and were not given access to opportunity. And in some cases in the in the West, after the Mexican-American War, exterminated. Uh, they didn't want to, to bring Hispanic people into the United States culture. So they, 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 they didn't uh, take all of Mexico, which they could have. <clears throat> Uh, Asians, Asians excluded from coming at all, Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, women of every color, forced by society, stay in the home, don't venture out. So you, can you get an idea how racism was formed in this country uh, and how white supremacy became popular? And we deal with this in a very real way today out in our own streets. Uh, so even even though the the, rec the reconstruction amendments and voting, voting laws, you know, say it isn't so. It, it, I mean, this. Everyone has the same rights. You still have people pushing and 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 getting away with this. Okay. Okay. So so back to imperialism. So let's let's change directions here a little bit and do a supplemental lecture right here. So I'm going to talk to you more about Teddy Roosevelt and and his kind of, uh, you know, the the part he plays in this era, uh, uh, especially with the, in regards to expansion. So the name of the lecture is Roosevelt War of 1898, formerly called the Spanish-American War. So in our politically correct uh, culture today, it's been determined that calling it the Spanish-American War is not fair to the Cubans, who, who were the ones that were, that were revolting. So uh, it doesn't give them credit. So I'm not sure they go from that to the War of 1898 that doesn't give anybody credit, but they, they, they don't consult me about these things. You know, I just kind of go along with it, okay? Okay, here's our, here's our uh, outline introduction. Yellow journalists challenge men to fight. Remember, yellow journalism, journalists uh, sensationalize the news to sell papers. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on Teddy Roosevelt, talk about his rough riders, how they forgot their horses, but how they're legendary for their attack on San Juan Hill. Uh, the results, uh, TR, Teddy Roosevelt gets the Medal of Honor posthumously, but hardly an effort worth the Medal of Honor. Relevance, the 10th Negro Cavalry have now been give, given credit for their part in the incident. I'm talking about the attack on San Juan Hill. They were in the center of the line and much close to the danger were more instrumental than Teddy in the incident. This incident is cited as an exaggerated example of the great white victor, okay? Which we talked about in our introductory lecture. Okay, let's get going. So the War of 1898, or formerly called the Spanish-American War. Uh, so what is this war about? Uh, well, it's Cuban patriots fighting Spain for independence in Cuba. So. America gets involved in this war in response to the vicious treatment of Cubans by the Spanish, okay? And yellow journalists, you remember William Randolph Hearst, they promote the idea of fighting against Spanish abuse, and they whipped the country into a nationalistic fervor. So when I talked about Hearst a chapter or two ago, I said that his yellow journalism would actually spark a war. Soon, here's the war. This is the one. So he 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 gets people fired up. We we we've got to help the Cubans. They're they're being abused in Cuba. I mean, so it's it's hard not to you know the 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 glaring obvious point here. It, interesting idea. Interesting question. You know why all the sympathy for Cubans? Now don't get me wrong. I got nothing against Cubans, and I'm not going that direction at all. But it's interesting that American people have this huge interest in the civil rights of Cubans while black people in the Jim Crow South in their own country could certainly use some sympathy and a break and, and, and access to their constitutional rights, but, but no one was worried about them. Let's go, let's go fight for the Cubans, but turn our backs on our own people in our own country. Uh, but understand, if you want to start a war, one way to do it is creating sympathy for an oppressed people is a good way to get people fired up. And that's what that's what Hearst and his and other journalists did. They fired people up to go save the Cubans. But the journalists also questioned America's manhood. And, and the claim was that, that men had gotten too soft in the industrial age. Men should become men again. So let's go fight a war. And so 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 Teddy Roosevelt's a perfect example of this need to show that you are a man. This is this is Teddy's MO from from the Day one, I mentioned in the last chapter how he was America's first macho man. Uh, you know, this, this, this is a man who, who, who needs to convince everybody he's a man. 
So, so Teddy is famous for his raid on San Juan Hill with the Rough Riders. I mentioned that last chapter also. Uh, so this is one of those one of those moments that you know, hallowed, sacred, kind of like remember the Alamo and Custer's Last Stand, and and I've talked to you about those two, how both of those have been embellished from the from the truth of what what really happened in those two incidents. Same same thing here. This is a very embellished moment. Although it's like I said, a hallowed moment in American history. So I want you to take note of this image with all these men. There's Teddy in the middle with with his with his guys. They're all on horseback and they're all coming to save the day. Okay, so keep keep that in mind about horses. <clears throat> okay, so when the war broke out, uh, Teddy was his his job was assistant to the Navy, but he quit and created a regiment of volunteers and he called them the rough riders and they would come to to come to cuba and and fight for a very short amount of time but famous for the battle of san juan hill okay uh but what's the true story i mean the the, the combat experience of of teddy's rough riders they were in an area of combat for one week that's it and they only had one day of actual fighting in combat the day of this of this uh, of this battle. <clears throat> so don't misunderstand me. The battle was significant, and 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 Teddy's regiment, the Rough Riders, were part of the taking of a fortified position. They were on the right side of the attack, and they made it to the top. Okay, so I'm not suggesting that there's something anything wrong with that. But I mean, you're anybody that faces the enemy's, you know, uh, bullets is taking a risk. Okay. Uh, but it's it, but it's interesting. They they were mostly on foot. Here's that picture again of them in court on horseback. And any any picture you see of the Rough Riders are all on horseback. They're they're, they're cavalry, okay. Uh, but but not true in the real story. Um, they were on foot. Why? Because there was some confusion when the ships left when they departed for Cuba from Tampa, Florida. Most of the horses were left behind. So when they got there, they only had a few, okay. They make it to the top, it's a victory, and Teddy says, the charge itself was great fun, and oh, but we had a bully fight. So, of course, people have, men have been killed that day, you know, it's it's not it's not like you, you know, when I like, like went on an adventure and I went fishing with your friend and came back and had a great day, people died. So, perhaps this is a little bit uh, an overzealous, you know, uh, d description of a day when people were killed. But because of what happened in this battle, Teddy earned a recommendation for the Congressional Medal of Honor. Of course, he's quite pleased. So the Congressional Medal of Honor is the highest award you can get for bravery in combat. Typically, the people that, that earn this earn it posthumously. They die in, in whatever, whatever they did. And you know, you're usually putting yourself at risk to save others uh whatever it might be okay so i uh, understand i'm not criticizing what teddy did but you know leading a, a regiment of men up a hillside under fire is a brave thing to do but hardly worthy of the medal of honor he, he didn't do anything that you know many thousands of, of men have done in the united states history and they didn't get the medal of honor so why why would he be recommended for the medal of honor well Turns out politics intervened and the request was denied. And this, of course, the rejection crushed him. But the truth is, but there's no question about it. It was less than a legendary effort. It just, it just wasn't worthy of the Medal of Honor. It's great you were there. It's great you volunteered. It's great you brought, brought your guys. It's great you got involved. It's great you went up the hill. But a lot of people do that. Okay, there's nothing, nothing here, nothing, nothing worthy of the Medal of Honor. But Roosevelt became famous from, from this incident, and he used his fame to become the governor of New York. Then he was McKinley's vice president, then the president. And interestingly, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor in 2001, so nearly uh, a little over 100 years later. So long after he's dead and just, what, 19 years ago, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Interesting in a time of social change, 20 years ago, you think that, that you wouldn't be pushing these types of things, but they do. He gets he he gets this this Medal of Honor anyway. Okay. 
uh, I mean, truthfully, the only reason why he got this Medal of Honor, if he hadn't had a post-war political career became the president, he probably wouldn't have. You or me it, it would, would have never received a medal for the same, the same effort. It was a pedestrian effort at best. So again, not trying to minimize warfare, bold decision to face fire from an enemy. I respect him for it, but hardly a, an effort worthy of the Medal of Honor. Interesting sidebar of the story, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., uh, Teddy's oldest son, and so coming forward to World War II now, um, was the only general on D-Day in World War II to land by sea with the first wave of troops. At 56 years old, he was the oldest man in the invasion, the invasion of D-Day. Uh, uh, and the only one, you know, whose son also landed that day. So Teddy's son and grandson landed at D-Day that day. Captain Quentin Roosevelt II was his grandson. So Teddy Roosevelt Jr. was among the first wave of soldiers at Omaha Beach, and this was a very integral moment. And this this man showed great bravery in keeping his troops together because they landed a little bit off where they were supposed to be, but he gathered them and took them on, and they became an integral part of the successful invasion, uh, Normandy Beach. So he wins the Medal of Honor also. So Teddy Roosevelt and his son have the Medal of Honor. Of course, Teddy didn't get his until his son and, and he were long gone. Um, but interesting that, that he would have a son that would win the Medal of Honor also. So today, modern historians, social historians, uh, revisionists, uh, you know, uh, going back in, in the past and correcting the things that are wrong, uh, searching for the truth, giving the oppressed a voice. Today, a social historian looks at this Battle of San, San Juan Hill very differently. It turns out that a regiment of black soldiers, or, or they were called Buffalo soldiers, the 10th Negro Cavalry, they were also there. Uh, they have now been, been given most of the credit for their part in this incident. They were in the center of the line, much closer to the danger, much more instrumental than Teddy in the success of this battle. So again, this is why this is why it's important to revise history, uh, because if it's not the truth, it's not really history. But also, everyone in every group gets the credit for what they deserve. So I I guarantee you that although this is the truth now, ninety percent of America don't know this. These are the types of things that you don't hear about very often, but it's the truth. Okay, to end the lecture, the relevance of the lecture, the 10th Negro Cavalry have now been given credit for their part in the incident. They were in the center of the line and much closer to the danger, were more instrumental than Teddy in the incident. The incident is cited as an exaggerated example of the great white victor. You know, you're not going to give a, a, a regiment of black soldiers a war, but you, but you will give it to the to the great white man. Of course, this is the turn of the 20th century. I don't, we don't live in that world today. Perhaps we do, but it, it, it was it was much different back then. Okay, okay, that's the end of that supplemental lecture. Okay, so let's go back to our to our war of um, 1898. Okay, so uh, you know this this is this is being promoted by by these journalists. Uh, Grover Cleveland, then McKinley, want to stay out of this of this incident. Uh, although Cuba was always seen as a, as a strategic location for the United States, it's only 90 miles off the coast of Florida, but yet it's never been been part of America. It's always been in somebody else's hands, and that's always been a contentious point for for America. Uh, Americans want Cuba. So, so what starts this, this, what gets America into this war? Well, you know, they, the, the government sent the battleship Maine down to Havana Harbor just to observe, just, just to be there in case. They're not at war, they're just there. Okay, just to kind of be there in case something happens. One night, very late in the, or early in the morning, um, there's a huge explosion on this battleship and 266 men were killed. Uh, and right, right away, yellow journalists start pointing at Spain. Okay, Spain, it's sabotage. They bombed, they torpedoed us. 
and the newspaper praised the chance to go to war. And this I and this this slogan remembered the Maine. So you got you know the remember the Alamo, Custer's Last Stand, uh, San, the 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 raid on San Juan Hill, all all these you know uh, sacred kind of wall goes to fire people up. Remember the Maine, another hallowed war cry. So the newspapers push for every man to prove his every American man, prove your manhood, join the army, go fight, and and uh, prove your manhood, and for the country to pr prove their manhood also. So all, all this rhetoric going on, people are excited, and almost giddy and happy, while 266 men had just been killed innocently while they were sleeping. Not a whole lot of remorse for the dead, just excitement about let's go to war. So the yellow journalist challenged the American men, come on, boys, let's go fight a war. Uh, now, what about this bombing? There's never any evidence that it was a bomb, uh, never any evidence of a torpedo. Uh, recent underwater studies of the hull of the main is still down the bottom of the harbor in, in, in Havana, still there. Uh, modern science today has indicated that it was likely an explosion on board that had nothing to do with Spain. The probability is there was some munitions, being highly explosive, too close to a a source of heat, and the munitions heated up and exploded. Okay, so it, so it was nothing to do with Spain at all. Uh, but in those days, you you couldn't talk anybody into believing that Spain were the were the bad guys. Let's go fight a war. So we talked about the Mexican American War, that that manufactured war to secure the valuable lands in Southeast United States. The Mexican session land. This is very similar to that. Country whipped up in a war fervor. So this is imperialism and nationalism at its very best. So part of the uh, part of the declaration of, of war against Spain included what's called the Teller Amendment. So the Teller Amendment was an amendment that said, as this war is beginning, that the United States had no intention of occupying Cuba. So if we win this war, and we defeat Spain, we are not going to occupy Cuba. And and don't think that they don't wish they could take that back because they've been trying to get Cuba for the entire 20th century and they could have had it very easily right there. The actual first battle of this war takes place in the Philippines. So that's on the whole other side of the of the of the world. Why why would why would that why would a war a, a, a war of independence in Cuba start in the Philippines? Well, that's where the Spanish fleet was. You're fighting against Spain, so so the uh, Commodore Dewey of the United States takes his navy to the to the Philippines and destroys the Spanish fleet uh, to take away their ability to you know uh, uh, come in support of a battle at, on, in Cuba. Uh, and McKinley makes a comment that proves he's very imperialistic. He's an imperialistic, expansionist-minded president. We must keep all we get. When the war is over, we must keep all we get. And so leaving little doubt, the United States had an imperialistic motive. Uh, also Hawaii. So, so Hawaii becomes a, a uh, United States territory here. But it was actually overthrown. It, 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 wasn't, uh, it wasn't a war. It wasn't battles. But uh, the queen, Lilio Kalani of Hawaii, was was taken deposed by U.S. Marines. The U.S. Marines showed up, again, threat of military force, and she had to step down over protests, but she had to step down. And since that time, the United States has has, has you know, taken Hawaii in its territory. And of course, I think it was 59, became the 50th state. Uh, but not a not a friendly thing. Why, what's so important about Hawaii? It's a, it's a cold stop halfway across the ocean to the Philippines, so that's why they wanted it. Uh, so even even today, you know, uh, native-born Hawaiians still have issues with white Americans. Why? Because they stole their their island from them and taken in a little bit of a different direction. You know, back in back in the during the 20th century. Hawaii was, you know, a, a, a beautiful paradise, not, not, you know, uh, stacks of hotels in every coach like, like it is today. You know, the, the United States turned it into a moneymaker and took away the beauty of the island. Not that it's still, not beautiful still, but uh, the native Hawaiians, you know, don't look fondly on, on that. They, they saw that as an imperialistic gesture. 
Okay. Um, so, so the fleet's defeated. So there's no worry about them supporting land troops, Spanish land troops in Cuba. So you go back to Cuba and you fight this war. But it, it devolves into guerrilla warfare. Cuba's a different place than the United States have been used to fighting. It's jungle. It's, it's tropical. It's wet. Uh, so a, a guerrilla force, guerrilla warfare, it's in, instead of large, two large armies squaring off against each other, you have these smaller mobile groups of irregular forces, not, not regular army, and they use hit and run tactics. They kind of jump in and jump out. Okay, like you can't you can't have a pitched battle. The, the the terrain won't allow you. There's lots of examples of guerrilla warf warfare in, in the United States history. George Washington fought a, a guerrilla warfare in the Revolutionary War, uh, but uh, specifically in the Southern theater of that war. If anyone saw the movie The Patriot, it's a good example of guerrilla warfare. This small group of men that that are harassing the British troops out of nowhere. Nowhere they 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 pop up out out of the trees. They they do their damage and then they're gone. Okay. Uh, now, of course, the Patriot just just to be to be um, honest here, it's, a, it's an entertaining movie, but very historically inaccurate. So please understand when you watch that. If you watch that movie, it's not it's not entirely the way that it happened. But uh, but the Civil War was also fought that way in parts of the South. The small small groups of of you know soldiers uh, moving on each other. Um, the Korean War was a guerrilla warfare. Vietnam was a was a guerrilla warfare. Okay. Okay, um, so long story short, Spain is worn out and they lose, and the United States wins. So what is what does the United States gain in, in this? They gain uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Of course, Hawaii also not because of the war, but because they 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 uh, occupied it, they they took it. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting um, image here. This is it was Uncle Sam and all of his new pupils. So. A lot going on in this picture. Here's Uncle Sam. Of course, he's the um, teacher, and here's his new pupils. And they don't look like they're very happy to be here. Uh, they they are the Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Here they are. They're gonna they're gonna learn the ways of America. They're gonna learn by Uncle Sam. The people back here are the are the people that have most that have acclimated to this. Typically white people, not entirely, but typically, uh, and they are. You know, quiet and serene, hard studying students. What 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 Uncle Sam wants to see in students, right? But interesting. You look at the rest of the film. Here here's an African American forced to wash the windows. He's kind of on the outside, you know, little over here saying, "Boy, I wish that they'd let me, uh, you know, uh, learn. That that'd be kind of nice." Native American sitting there, not sure if he's inside or outside. He's reading a book, but the book's upside down. He's not. He, allowed to 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 gain anything like gain any kind of education like like everybody else the asian is outside the door because he was excluded chinese exclusion act excluded asians from coming here chinese to, from coming here for 60 years a so lot, lot going on here and and you know it's a, a symbolic of of the cultural uh uh you know uh, envi uh environment uh, fabric of, of that time okay that, that, that this is this is a good example of what's going on Okay. Um, okay. So according to McKinley, uh, once the Philippine War, once once the war was over, you, you've got to deal with the Filipinos because they're they're part of the war too in the Philippines. We cannot leave the Filipinos to themselves. They were unfit for self rule. So you know, pretty, you know, who's to say whether he had that 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 kind of knowledge? But he he judges them. They're they're not worthy of self rule. Uh, so much like the war with Mexico, the United States benefited from a weaker opponent and gained much, and their standing as an emerging world power became more emphasized. So again, an ethnocentric statement from the President of the United States. Could you imagine a president making that statement today? Although, although we 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 do hear statements that come pretty close. Um, okay, so but so so you you do have some anti-imperialist sentiments that are in response to a very loud United States. And they, they argued that no power was given to the government by the Constitution to conquer and colonize, but yet you're out there doing it. So, so again, like Jennings Bryan I mentioned earlier, 
there was a small movement against this idea. It, it's bullying. You're, you're, it's, it's, it's big boys taking the ice cream out of the little boy's hand kind of thing. Uh, so not, not everybody was, was in support, but most people were fervently in support of all this type of thing. But in the Philippines, it, it didn't stop that easy. So, so Cuba's, Cuba's, it's done there. But in the Philippines, the Philippines were not ready to, to give up their, their home to, to the Americans. So you, it actually devolves into a, uh, a, another war. So related to the Spanish-American War, the War of 1898, but two different wars. Okay, the Philippine-American War, 1899-1902, so a you know, three, four-year-long war. Uh, and and this one is 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 pretty tragic as far as death. Four thousand Americans killed in the Philippine American War. In the Spanish American War, just a handful of, of Americans had died. But in this war, four thousand American troops, a hundred thousand Filipinos killed. And long story short, of course, it lasts a while, but the Philippines loses. They become an American territory. Uh, Insular case is one of your terms, the emergence of an American empire. So what are insular cases? Citizenship is not automatically extended to people living in areas acquired by the United States. So you, you defeated us. This is a territory of the United States. We're Filipino. Do we get the rights of an American citizen? No, not automatically extended. So you understand the America's happy to get their land, their resources, use use their use their land for strategic value, gain coal, have a coal stop, but the people that live there, the, the natives, gain no advantage. Talk about the Teller Amendment in the, in the uh, Declaration of War that said that they would not uh, occupy Cuba. They then uh, submit the Platt Amendment, and this would outline relations between the United States and Cuba until 1934. So the Platt Amendment blocked Cuba from entering any treaties with any other country other than the United States, and the United States could intervene in their affairs. So, so wait a second. D didn't the Teller Amendment claim that the U.S. had no intentions of occupying Cuba, but yet here they're saying that they could intervene in their affairs? <laughs> Isn't that the same thing? Uh, this is history. So after McKinley's assassination, Roosevelt saw the United the United States as the protector of the world. The civilized and orderly powers to insist on the proper policing of the world. And then there's that word, policing. So the United States, even today, considers themselves the policemen of the world. Okay, this is this is what our, our, our job is. Um, another policy that came out of this era is the open door policy. <clears throat> uh, nations, including the United States, had equal access to Chinese markets. So understand, all nations still see China as the most coveted market, and it was very, very competitive. So the United States created this policy to give everyone equal access to China and also not allow anyone to gain control or monopolize Chinese markets. But truthfully, in this era, Japan was the rising star, rising power in Asia. Uh, um, and at the beginning of accumulating power that would be seen in World War II. So, so Japan is on the rise here, which would result in them uh, you know, being imperialistic on their own right in World War II. But we haven't even seen World War I yet, so, but we're getting there, we're almost there. So Roosevelt pushes for the Panama Canal, okay? Uh, mostly for trade, uh, but also for military might. You can move your army, for your, your navy from the Pacific to the Atlantic, or vice versa, without having to go all the way around South America. Uh, and it also was built in 1914, just in time for World War I. So please take our first break and watch our first film here. The, the film is entitled, Who Built the Panama Canal? Go ahead and watch that, and then come on back. Okay, so you you remember the Monroe Doctrine of, of, uh, of 1823 uh, that said that Europe uh, should stay out of North and South America. If, you know, if if, if, if the uh, European this goes to 18, 1823, if Europeans come, America would see it see it as an act of war. Uh, in 1904, Teddy Roosevelt uh, submits an amendment to the Monroe Doctrine called the Roosevelt Corollary, 
And it says the United States would intervene in the affairs of the Caribbean and Latin America. So not just protect them, like the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine said, because the, the Monroe Doctrine covered North and South America. We're going to protect you from European colonization. And we're not going to let it happen anymore. But now here, here you are, 75 years or whatever later. Now, now he's saying we're going to intervene in, in, uh, in their affairs. Uh, in the affairs of, of, the, of the Caribbean islands and Latin American countries. So this is the famous uh, image of, of Teddy walk softly and carry a big stick. He's got his Navy that he's put together. Uh, he was so proud of his Navy, he painted all the ships white and sent them on a, on a round the world tour to, to uh, impress the world with how big the United States Navy was. So that was his baby. So he's got them on a string. He's barefooted tromping through the Caribbean. Uh, and everyone's in, as long as everybody's in order, I, I won't use my big stick, but cross me and I'll use my big stick. Walk softly, but carry a big stick. Um, okay, we left off the last chapter with Wilson uh, being elected. Uh, <clears throat> but he's different, anti-expansionist, anti-imperialist, or at least so he says. According to Wilson, the United States would never again seek one additional foot of territory by conquest, but then he intervenes in the Mexican Revolution. So, you know, you're not sure who to believe here. Um, and the intervention in the Mexican Revolution, there's still bad feelings between Mexico and the United States over that. This brings us up to World War I, 1914, 1918. So we talked about the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austrian Hungarian throne. That's the incident that kicks off this, this war. And it, it really is about countries in Europe jockeying for position as the Ottoman Ottoman Empire weakened. The Ottoman Empire had been a power for, you know, hundreds of years. They are now weakening, and this happens in history, and there, there's a power vacuum, and people, countries try to, try to fill that void. So these two factions of European countries square off. The Triple Alliance is Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy versus the Triple Entente, Britain, France, and Russia. So notice there's no United States there. Uh, America took an isolationist stance. Again, going back to the Monroe Doctrine, we're, we're, don't come over here, we won't go over there. So we're not gonna come fight your war. This is a European war, we're staying out of it. Uh, we don't want anything to do with this, okay? So this war begins, but I mentioned this before, we talked about it, um, you know, it, it, a little bit about the Civil War, how technology, Modern weapons, artillery, cannons, and so on, had, had advanced beyond field tactics. The, the generals were still maneuvering their troops the way they had 100 years ago, but the weapons were wiping people out like they did 100 years ago. So in this war, immediately millions of people die. Soldiers are getting killed right and left because the weapons are, are so uh, you know, uh, powerful and, and um, effective. So. This, this war somewhat devolves into what's called trench warfare. So we'll talk a little bit about how the end of the Civil War around Petersburg kind of starts this idea. You dig trenches, you try to get closer by digging trenches every, every day to get closer to your enemy, but you typically, you gain you know, a little, you lose a little every day. But, it, but brutal fighting, you know, forced to, these, these men living in these trenches, they're shell-shocked from, weapons and, and munitions exploding around them all the time. You're shelling your opponents nonstop. A pretty awful way to, to fight a war. Not that there's a good way, but this is a, a uh, somewhat of an emasculating way because you're, you're really somewhat uh, helpless to, to do much. You're, just, you're, just, you're, you're mostly just taking cover the best you can. On occasion, your commander says, let's charge them. That, that's just an invitation for death. There's not, not a whole lot to gain here. Uh, so this area between these two armies is called no man's land, and it's typically a wasteland. If you've seen the movie War Horse, 2011, the young man has his horse taken from him because of the war, and the horse goes from you know goes on like on an adventure. Of course, that's the story of the movie. But towards the end, the horse breaks loose and it's running around, and it gets tripped up and stuck in barbed wire, and there's shells exploding everywhere. That's that's no man's land. This this kind of you don't want to be up there because you're going to get killed, okay? It's just bombs and bullets. It's just a wall of lead everywhere. 
Okay, let's take another break and watch another film. Please watch the film entitled Life in a Trench, and we'll kind of get an idea what trench warfare is about. Okay, so this war begins, it's ugly, but the United States stays neutral, isolationists. Uh, but they still want to trade with the warring countries. You want, you want to keep those dollars flowing. We don't mind making money, but we're not going to fight. But then two things happen that push the United States to join the war. Uh, the first is German U-boats. So, so U-boat stands for underseas boat. Um, these, these are submarines, and you've you never seen this before. Not that there weren't submarines. The first submarine that, to actually sink a ship happened in the Civil War you know, 50, 60 years before this war, but, but now an effective force of, of many of these underwater boats. Uh, so the German U-boats became a menace, especially in the North Atlantic, and they warned countries, we're at war. Uh, any ship aiding Britain in the war effort, we're going to sink them, okay? And of course, the United States, England are screaming, you know, uh, at Germany, you cannot attack innocent passenger lines that are crossing the ocean. And Germany says, if they've got weapons or we suspect them, we're going to sink them. And and then it happens. May 7th, 1915, the Lusitania, a British liner, was sunk. Uh, 1,198 dead or 1,260 dead, according to that paper. Num numbers, numbers of dead are always kind of skewed for some reason, but you get the idea. More, more than uh, 1,200 or so people, uh, but out of those, 128 were Americans. Of course, that's a big deal. 128 Americans died because of this European war. That gets the president um, uh, interested. So the protests were that the ship was a passenger ship only, although later it was learned that it was actually carrying munitions for the war effort. Germany gave them a fair warning. They took the chance, and they paid the ultimate price, and the ship was sunk. But, but Wilson's furious. And he begins to start building up the American military. We're going to join this war. We don't know when, but we're going to join. The second thing is known as the Zimmerman tele telegram. And this, this is really interesting to me anyway. The, the United States intercepted a telegram uh, from uh, uh, Germany to Mexico, and where Germany is asking Mexico to join them in the war effort. Of course, you're the United States' neighbor. If you join our war effort, they'll stay there to fight you and not come here. Okay, so if you can hold them, you know, hold them to, to not come over here and we win this war together, we will give you all of your Mexican session lands back that, that was taken from you in the, in the War of Mexico. Uh, so <clears throat> that had to get their attention because that's this is value, hugely valuable land. Uh, Mexico did not take that offer, <clears throat> probably because they realized this is our neighbor. They're a lot stronger than we are. You know, we've, we've already seen that, you know, 50, 60 years ago, 60, 70 years ago in the Mexican-American War. Um, let's not tempt fate here. So they, they don't do it. But America finds out about this, gets pretty angry. Um, and they, but, but honestly, there's one more reason. Uh, a couple, almost three years have gone by this war going on. And, and America's, American citizens are watching Europe just just get destroyed. Millions of people are dying. The truth is, those people were still America's brethren, still America's people. There's there's grandmothers and, and uncles and aunts over there, uh, uh, sometimes parents. So it, it finally kind of came down to, uh, you know, that that it was. Uh, you want to come to their aid and come come to their you know to to, to help them okay okay um, so so America joins the war and August uh, I'm sorry April second nineteen seventeen uh, Germany declares war I'm sorry United States declares war on Germany this is very late in the war April second nineteen seventeen you've only got a little less than a year and a half to go. Uh, so, no, but understand, all these European countries, Britain, France, Russia, not happy that America waited so long, okay? Uh, Russia specifically saying, you're our ally and you just stayed out for three years while we're getting, getting killed. We're, we're trying to put an end to, you know, uh, anarchism and all these awful things that, that um, we all should be fighting against, but you chose not to. And because of that, 
millions of Russians died. So Russia will always can, will continue to have this grudge against America. And it'll happen again in World War II and will fuel the split that, of course, they become mortal enemies. Okay, so, so the, the, the separation of Russia and, and the United States starts in this war. Uh, you know, uh, they start to become adversaries. And interesting, right? Shortly after America enters the Bolshevik Revolution, happened. We talked about that in Russia. So Russia was forced to pull out of World War One. They just completely pulled out. That that left the Eastern Front unsecure, and Germany just took over the Eastern Front. So understand, before Russia left, you had the Western Front with British Britain and France, you know, of uh, squaring off against the against the German Germans, and in the east, you had the Eastern Front with with Russia and Germany squaring off, but now Russia just, Russia just, we're gone. So Germany takes over the Eastern Front without, without any, you know, not much effort. Okay. Um, so after the East was secured, Germany focused on a major push on the Western Front. But truthfully, again, I could talk for hours about World War One, but in, in the, uh, we, we got to keep moving here. The addition of the United States forces just turned out to be too much for Germany. So I'm not suggesting that the that the war was won because of the United States, that they were the overwhelming factor. They they were a huge factor, but um, the war probably would have been won at some point without the United States. But because they came in and they were fresh, and you know, uh, <clears throat> you'll you'll see in a film or two in this. I think it's in this chapter. I think it's yeah. Um, uh, men that are suffering from shell shock, men, men that are worn out from war, and they shake even when they're 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 not in a war. Uh, they shake from from you know the fear of of sh of a shell blowing up around them. Uh, these men were worn out. The United States troops were fresh, so that addition kind of you know put them over the top, and the and the Allied forces, the the uh, Entente forces, win. Okay. Uh, so American casualties in a in a year and a half very high, twenty six thousand killed, twenty six thousand men killed, ninety five thousand wounded, one hundred twenty thousand casualties in this war, uh, in just a little over a year and a half. But understand that's that's nothing compared to what happened in Europe. The carnage in Europe was absolutely astonishing. No one had ever seen it before. The entirety of Europe looked like this. All the manufacturing centers, cities were were destroyed total casualties in the entire war world war one is 40 million so 26,000 of those were american but the total number 40 million of that 40 million 18 million were killed uh you've never had a battle in the history of mankind where that many people had died uh soldiers men women children elderly it was a horrifying waste of life uh so again the idea of technology exceeding the military tactics that were outdated is a huge uh, reason why that why it happened that way okay okay um so going back to the as america enters the war effort you know what what happens in, when you have a, a war is most of the men in in those days anyway men working in the factories they leave their factory jobs to go fight the war this created an opportunity for people, and this creates the great migration of African Americans for the for the first time in the Jim Crow South, still still post Civil War era. You're only talking about 40, 50 years since the war ended. Um, and if you're an African American in the South, you're under that oppressive KKK, Jim Crow, black codes, kept from voting, you know, um, beaten, raped lynch that that's you, you you live a life of absolute fear but now you've got you hear word about jobs in the north because all these men have left these jobs so so many um hundreds of thousands of african americans leave the jim crow south four hundred thousand leave to to escape the lynchings and and the uh white supremacists and they come north so this is the great migration uh, you, you, you've had it with Jim Crow, uh, racism, discrimination, all those kind of things. You, you're going to encounter it in the North too, but not quite so bad. 
But also Mexicans came to take advantage of opportunities that the war made available. Wars, so wars are good for business and the economy. Women, mostly white, took advantage, became factory workers. You, you get the start of what became known as Rosie the Riveter. That would become famous in World War II more than World War I. But it starts in World War I. So women proved that they're not so soft, not so pampered. Everyone was concerned they'll never do the job of the men. Production's going to drop considerably. And when the women came, production did not drop. Uh, so women proved they could do the same job as a man. So don't think that that didn't crush the egos of the Victorian man, okay? Uh, and, and you know, their, their new stature found in fighting this war finally resulted in women getting the vote, August 26, 1920. This is the 19th Amendment. Okay, so, so the uh, United States and their allies win this war. Uh, Wilson, after the war, President Wilson, in an attempt to solidify Europe and America's group of allies, suggested a League of Nation, the Nations. This is the precursor to the United Nations today, okay? Uh, let's get together, let's meet, let's let's have a you know constant narrative so we know what's going on so these things won't come out, out of the blue and surprise us. Um, we'll see it coming. Uh, so this is a suggestion in there and they're, they're, they're mulling it over and thinking about it. The Treaty of Versailles uh, was signed June 28th, 1919. Five years to the day of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand that started the whole thing. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles was very harsh on Germany. They they were the instigators. They were the they were the uh, the uh, you know ones that started this whole thing. So they were uh, you know given a uh, penalty, uh, and it was determined that they they owed they needed to pay <clears throat> other European countries thirty three billion dollars. In reparations. <clears throat> so $33 billion is a large number today, but in, in 1918, 1919, an incredible number. You might as well say you owe all the money in the world because there's no way they're ever going to pay it. Well, I mean, they actually did, but it would take them decades. But what it did do is it led to a, a huge anger in, in young German men because you've taken away our honor, you've taken away the fatherland. You've taken away all these. Now you're going to punish us. And you want us to, to, to get in line and, and, and do what you say. And we don't like this. So many historians argue that the start of, of the rise of World War I happened during the fall. Of, I'm sorry. The rise of World War II happened during the fall of World War I. And a very young Adolf Hitler, disillusioned by Germany's defeat and angry on on. on over reparations, that this would ignite his rise to power. So you could say that Hitler rose out of the ashes of World War I, rose out of the trenches, because he was fighting in the trenches in World War I. So many historians feel that this was the beginning of World War II 20 years later. Let's watch our next film. Uh, this next film is entitled uh, Adolf Hitler's Defeat and Transformation in World War I. Uh, so this is um, his experiences, what his job was. He was a courier uh, for the trench um, trench warfare, probably one of the more dangerous jobs because you're running around everywhere. You can be seen by your enemy. So instead of hunkered down in a trench, you're you're having to, to take messages everywhere. Uh, the film will also quite quote his autobiography that he would write later. Uh, his autobiography was called Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, My Fight. And he talks about his anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish -Jew, uh, points of view. Okay, uh, so go ahead and watch that film, and then come on back. Okay, so back to Woodrow Wilson's idea of the League of Nations. As part of the League of Nations, he proposes what he calls his 14 points. Uh, this is going to <clears throat> be a new world or order. Uh, you can have up, and and th this this is going to bring us all together so you won't have another world war like this ever again. Open diplomacy, freedom of the seas. I'm not going to read all these, but you get the idea. Removal of economic barriers, reduction of armaments, all to create a world peace. Okay. Uh, this is his idea of the, of the new world order that would be highlighted by his League of Nations. And this war, it wasn't called World War I because there hadn't been a World War II 
two. You, you, you kind of have to have more than one to, to call the first one one. They didn't know what this was. It was a big war. So they called it the Great War or the War to End All Wars. Uh, it's so bad. The carnage is so awful. The, the, the death toll was so large. We'll never do it again. We learned our lesson. We'll never make that mistake again. Okay. The carnage was too great. Of course, 20 years later, they would do it again to much bigger numbers, but don't tell anybody, but we're, 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 we're moving that direction. Uh, so, so all of these wonderful ideas of Wilson's, but not everybody supported it. Congress, many congressmen didn't support it at all. It's got to pass Congress. Uh, many, many congressmen felt that it would re-entangle the United States in European affairs. We are isolationists. We don't want to be part of Europe, Monroe Doctrine. Uh, we we went and fought the war because they needed us, but now it's over. Let's 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 remove ourselves. Let them be. Uh, we don't want to get tangled in European affairs, but also perhaps even more importantly, it was feared that that being in in a group like that would would diminish the United States' ability to develop its own foreign policy or imperialism okay, to get more land. Okay, so Wilson loses. Congress votes the league down. This is a bitter, bitter defeat um, for, for Wilson. Uh, this, this was his baby, and it, it didn't get passed, and he was crushed. And uh, he would die six years later, still a pretty young man, 67 years old, uh, somewhat broken. Uh, but the reason why they didn't pass the League of Nations is because they just didn't think it was necessary. We, we learned our lesson. We're never going to do that again. Of course, like I said, they, they, they will do that again. Okay. Um, so at the end of World War I, America is a superpower in the world. This is where it starts. America is now a bona fide superpower in the world with holdings around the world uh, for them to base their future as the policemen of the world. Okay, so let's watch our last film. Uh, please watch the film entitled "How America Became a Superpower." So this is the this is going to go before and after our our era, but kind of give you a thematic look at America's rise to power. Go ahead and watch that film, and then come on back. Okay, that is the end of Chapter Twenty One in the World War One era. Um, moving towards the Roaring Twenties, the Depression, World War Two. Thank you. <laughs>